Hey, I'm BB Miniatures, and let's just get stuck straight into tutorial. And we can start off with the palette. The colors you see here, we're going to go through them quite quickly. You can also find them in the description. So we have a, a deep brown, followed by light skin. And then on the purple side, we also have the uh, sunset purple with a fuchsia, and as well as a pastel violet, and of course, some white. The white that I use is, uh, it doesn't really matter which white you use, but in this case I'm used using Schmincke Titanium White and a black. Um, all the colors here I like using my two favorite brands of paint, which is uh, Scale Color by Scale 75, as well as uh, AK's third generation paints. Um, both of them work out really, really well, and uh, I really like the flow and the consistency that they, they give off with the majority of their colors. Starting off with the deep brown, so you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just making a mix that will just give us like a base tone. So instead of just using the um, deep brown straight out of the pot, I put a pinch of that sunset purple in there and then just darken it out just a little bit, just with a little bit of black and um, give a little bit of a thin to the colors. I never really like to choose uh, use paints straight out of the pot. Um, if I really want a pretty like opaque layer, I always add a little bit of water just to help with a little bit of flow, as well as with the style of painting where I like to use um, subsequent layers building up. This will, you know, help prevent getting the the uh, the surface of the model getting too chunky, too thick, and where you can actually see um, visible unwanted texture, which uh, shouldn't be mistaken for building up um, texture on the model. Uh, that I like to use to represent uh, various um, various materials, as you can see with like the the, the various uh, skin and bones of you know, like bonish armor of the Tyranid model. Um, I, you know, I want to make it quite rough and you know quite uh, just interesting and just give a little bit of a feeling. Now, as we applying the just the base tones. Um, there's just a little bit of water in there just to help the paint flow a little bit. So I would say like, you know, thinned out with around 20, 25% uh, water to, to paint. And I'm just applying it pretty like kind of splotchy. I'm not actually looking for a uniform, uh, a, a uniform coat. So the nice thing is about painting this lictor is we can actually, um, <laughs> you know, less stress on us by trying to give like a unified coat. As you can see, I'm just blocking in almost all the majority of the surface and I'm leaving the black undercoat um, exposed just on the, the, the deepest of recesses. So those um, kind of like pits in this uh, bone armor. I'm going to reference that as like bone from now on. You know, it can really be whatever you want, but it kind of looked like a, a, a harder like armored hide in comparison to I'm going to reference the purple as the skin, even though it more looks to me like a, like a thinner or like an exoskeleton where these parts are the parts that we're painting right now are just more like the bonier protrusions and weird crowns and stuff. But that's what makes it kind of fun and neat, um, especially through this bone stuff, this this bonish armor, it's going to be more like I want to illustrate it more rougher. So um, as we progress, um, you're going to see some some changes. But here I'm just like just wanting to show you um, just how I am just base coating each of these. You can be quite messy. It doesn't really matter too much. And again, patchiness is OK. And it's actually preferred to get this textured look. You you know, you we don't want to be going for a uniform coat at all. That'll actually make the uh, the texturized look a lot harder to achieve. And, you know, <laughs> why would I want to make it harder on myself? So um, this is fine. It's easy. Just be nice and loose. And again, I'm only if you see like black primer showing through. Yeah, that's OK. Um, and I try to like I'm not being, uh, you know, I'm not being super stingy if it gets in the recesses. If it does, it does. If it doesn't on those, uh, especially the whereas talking about like those pits and stuff like that, all, all the better. OK, 
it, so when we get to the um the, the the big claws the kind of like the praying mantis claws i think those are like a huge really cool feature of the lictor and how we're going to illustrate that here is is to you know illustrate the life and the curvature and instead of trying to you know try to highlight each segment on its own you know and with each what i mean by like each segment of those armor panels um you know some people will try to illustrate the the transition from dark to light on each panel rather i'm going to take this entire uh this entire length of the of the um the mantis limb and we're going to treat it as one giant limb so all of our light is going to be the majority of the highlights are all going to be focused on the front and it's going to fade into um into shadow into the recess this just kind of for me i find this a lot more interesting and uh just how i like to uh, light <laughs> you know like highlight models and give it a little more of a feature i pick the front of it not just because it's got uh, the you know the sharp point but it's actually like if we're looking at it the model from the front view those those elements are actually closest to us so I want to bring a little more emphasis that's uh, on on limbs and uh, features that are more forward. And as it's going uh, towards the rear of the model, it gets a little bit darker. This just adds just more drama to it. And I, I quite like the uh, just the look and the style that I, that I enjoy to paint. So if you want to replicate this, of course, follow. Very similar here as well. The purple skin just starts off with some sunset purple and I've just added a little bit of, of black into there just to um, give me a little more of a darker a tone but nothing uh, you know nothing super fancy but again um, a similar idea that we were doing for the base coating of the the bone is it's okay it's gonna be patchy um, because we are going to be adding a little bit more texture. The, the bone itself is a bit smoother. I find like I didn't go uh, at the finished uh, the, the finished state. It wasn't as like rough as as the bone, but we still um, you know we're still going to apply some you know brush strokes and, and texture into there. So so the nice thing is again we can kind of we don't have to stress too much and. Uh, we don't mind if the base coat here is a bit patchy and we're not aiming for a, a super even finish throughout the entire thing. I think you get the idea that I, you know, I kind of just almost like <laughs> blob it on, which is quite nice. It's just uh, <laughs> it takes a lot less stress out of it than trying to do like even armored base coats like on like a Space Marine or something. If you want to make it look clean, you know, we have to stress do multiple layers. This one we can kind of just uh, chuck it on. <laughs> Okay, so this is where you know we're going to get into texturizing the bone armor and how we're going to apply that. Um, you get to see that the the mixtures that I made there with that deep brown, I just add a little bit of light skin uh, into the highlight, and then we're going to be adding more light skin as we progressively get lighter and lighter. So he actually does have kind of like a like <laughs> the bone is actually like a fleshier color, um, but of course you know we're not painting we're not painting flesh, but you know, even those names on paints, you know, light skin. It's just it's just a, a light orange. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be used for skin. But back to like the technique on what I'm doing here. Notice when I'm reaching onto the palette is I'm getting very little. I want to have very little bit of not a lot of charge into the brush. And what I mean by charge is the amount of paint that's in my bristles. Um, a good word, a word of uh, a good rule when you're picking up paint is I don't want any I don't want a ton of external paint on the 
outside of the brush. I want all the paint to be within it. So when I feel that I have too much paint on the outside of the brush or just too much charge, I, I commonly just use my thumb or sometimes I wipe it on the, the, the kitchen towel that I'm using to dry my brush after rinsing it. And uh, this makes sure that the paint doesn't blob on too much. So the, for, for the first layer of we're doing this, again, you know, don't need to worry about even base coats or even layers, for instance, the patchiness and the and a little bit of the, um, the you know, the, the th little bit of the thinning of the paint, letting that work to our advantage. But what I'm doing here now is I'm just doing like a very kind of like sketchy style and sketching out the highlights of the model. To work out where your highlights are on the lictor or well, if it's on the lictor, you can use, of course, the model here as a direct reference. But for the rest of the tier and models and for just highlighting in general, we really want to try to find interesting curves. Curves are like the nicest and uh, the most, um, I'd say the most forgiving thing to highlight because wherever you're, uh, you kind of kind of pick an uh, a point in space where you want the light to come from. And then what you want to do is when you trace an invisible line or wherever your light point is and it's connecting onto the subject, you want to, you generally want to put highlights at the apex of curves and points. So anything that's protruding outwards has like a nice bell curve or just a, a nice curve in general, like on the crown or on some of these spikes here. I'm just picking the apex point of it. And even with on ridges that stick up, the same thing. The other thing that you can also do, uh, which is really, really handy, is uh, after you've base coated it, you can kind of get the idea. You can kind of see, of course, the areas that are still in primer as I'm just for filming. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do every single part. I kind of want to get you uh, get the filming forward so you can see it in stages. It gets a little bit quicker, but you can see how like under the lamp, you can kind of see where the the black primer is highlighted and shadowed. That can kind of give you a rough map to where to place your highlights. Even more so if you find it a little bit tricky to do in the process of painting, what you can do after you prime it is take a photo uh, with your phone or with a, a camera, take a, take a photo of it and just keep it at your desk as a point of reference. You can kind of see where the light falls and uh, you know where it's being hit from your lamp and where it's being shadowed and just use that as a reference trace when you're tracing out the highlights especially at the very beginning um, at this initial highlighting stage when we're being selective of where to place these first highlights we could uh, we could be we can go a little bit slower and we could trace out the lights using the reference after that the the secondary highlights and the third stages as we build up we already have a map kind of sketched out already so we don't have to refer to our photograph so much but for here when we're sketching you know i'm just trying to use more of the the end of the tip of the brush you know i'm not using much of the elongated side and uh, still being a, you know, again, you can just be a little bit, you can be loose. And, and, and so that's the nice thing. Again, it's a, it's always a, actually a, a quite relaxing to paint this Tyranid Lictor. Here's where you can start to see how I'm going to gather the light forward. So I'm going to like, in general, like, especially painting these mantis claws, I always start at the highest point the lightest point and then work my way um, back and with the what's also going to help is a bit of the brush stroke direction so it is always almost pretty much most of my strokes are always going to the front of the model which just helps kind of um, build up the last bit of pigment that gets deposited at the end and if you time this right as I'm painting each of these claws, I have enough charge in here 
that I am not going to reload my brush. Rather, every segment that I paint, except for this part, <laughs> you know, it's not always perfect. But as I go backwards, um, I'm not going to try not to reload the brush because it's starting to lose charge. And then the paint stroke actually gets a little bit weaker as I go back because there's less uh, there's less paint in my brush and there's only very little charge when it comes to the end. But if you also notice, I'm always hugging. If you want to look at each individual segment of the claws, I'm always hugging the pigment uh, closest, always going uh, to the front. So um, you, some people that I've seen, you might have a tendency to stick to the edges. So that would be at the back side of each segment. I need you to think in reverse and think always paint towards the light. Doing it this way, you will um, that will give the illusion of the you're painting a little bit more depth and, uh, you know, just giving a little more drama and emphasis towards the front of the curvature. And it just helps uh, illustrate the actual curvature of the the entire claw. Here we're just building up another layer. Now with each subsequent layer of highlight you can do, the one the couple of things are gonna happen. Of course, we, we want our highlights to get a little bit smaller as well as um, in our strokes, we wanna get a little bit thinner. Later on, I'll be switching to a smaller brush, a finer brush to get more finer scratches, where currently right now, I'm still using my uh, my number one, my size one, um, and it's a, it's a Raphael, which um, has quickly become one of my favorite uh, <laughs> sketching brushes for this type of work and for just, um, you know, uh, non-refined work but enough to get pigment down and, uh, you know, start the painting. You also notice with the head, um, that armor down the center, there's a big ridge. If you really want to make that ridge punch out and help, uh, help um, illustrate the, the shape a little bit better, what I did is I favored the right side over the left. So there's going to be a majority of the highlight is going to be on the right side. And then on the left side, I'm going to leave a little bit of a gap. And when you see a highlight right next to a shadow, that generally indicates that a, there's a there's an edge. There's a there's a, a sudden change in angle. And uh, that just helps further push it out. I will highlight the left side, but it won't be as bright as the the, the side on the right just to give a little more emphasis and a little more shape. So you can see I've added um, more light skin to the highlight. And now I'm starting to, I'm still using the number one, but this is where I really start to, um, I really start to reduce the amount of charge in your brush. It's really, really critical to help to have a very reduced amount of charge in your brush so your paint doesn't blob out and you're allowed to make these thinner marks. And this is just, this is still with a number one. And it's also very critical to get a feel for brush pressure. So I don't want the brush to flex all that much. And I want to try to use as much of the tip of the brush as possible, not allowing it to flex because when the brush flexes, that will create uh, that will create a larger surface area of the brush to touch on the model, therefore making the mark bigger and also dispensing more paint. So, if it's anything that to help, a fun little trick that I like to keep in mind when I'm doing this is I am trying to tickle the surface as lightly as possible. So I barely want it to touch the model. And uh, and just to keep a light a light touch in mind, so I could uh, create these uh, thinner, more sketchier marks. Again, you can still be like you know you, you you're still I like to try to keep loose, and um, I'm still trying not to be you know extremely picky. If you do the odd um, brush slip or whatever. 
Uh, most of the time you can just embrace it and just keep going. Um, the, the trick to creating these like loose textures and this roughness of this bone is all about the layering. So if you kind of screw up in one part of the area during a during the first few layering processes, don't worry, you're going to be going over it again subsequently. But and, you know, for the most part, it'll kind of erase itself or just become a, a part of the texture part of the model itself. So I'm not trying to be too picky. It's only when we get to like the brightest or the, the higher highlights where um, we want to be more careful. And, but the nice thing is, is that once we're at those higher stages, there's a lot less area to cover. So you're actually not painting a whole lot because there's very little surface left to cover. Here you can kind of see, you know, the, the strokes I'm doing, everything from like lines and like, you know, connecting stripes that cut across through parts of the model. Um, the more the gap that you see, you know, that it, if you've ever like maybe like was drawing with a pencil as a kid or something, you're doing shading, you know, if you notice that the gaps, the, the wider, the larger the gaps in between your, your shading, the lighter it is and the more um, dense <laughs> dense of the brush, the, the you know, uh, the the darker it gets. So, you know, just by sketching the area and just kind of being kind of loose and the more highlight you gather uh, with that's all solid together, that's the brighter the highlight. But we can always use like thin little weird cuts and stuff to cut across through shadows to just give a little bit of uh, uh, of texture and interest there, but we could see a difference between the lighter and the darker areas. as well through this uh, process if you're mixing the highlights and you think that you've gone too bright don't worry in the uh, <laughs> the next stages when we um, get to the AK uh, deep shades well the nice thing is that kind of um, ties everything together and um, knocks down your, your brightest highlight so you don't have to stress if anything it's actually better to go lighter than you think you need to go because uh you know we'll lose some of the brightness and luminosity when we get to that stage here i'm uh, as i was mentioning earlier on the head crust in particular sorry crest <laughs> um to give that uh give that um illustrate that the shape that there's that sharp bridge down the middle I didn't have the highlights on the left side um, bridge into that center column. I want to leave a gap so there's a highlight gap of a shadow and then light again. That'll just help you reinforce that shape. Again, doing the mantis claw. I'm always again starting at the brightest part, which is at the very, very tip and working my way backwards. And again, each of those segments, do you see how again, my highlights are hugging the front end of the segment, which is actually like butting right into the recess because the, each of these segments look like they're like overlapping segments. And uh, just like I said before, it might look a little bit, <laughs> it might look a little bit odd or feel a little bit of a contradiction that we're like painting into that recess and leaving the outward edge darker. But again, um, this is important. This directional painting is important to giving that illusion to and for the lighting. So we're guiding the light and we're guiding the viewer forward to the 
closest and the most sharpest part of the uh, the mantis claw itself. There you can start to you can start to see the overall transition. If you want, you can kind of like, you know, I'm kind of like picking, um, pick a general point. Like, so when I get to the middle here, this is where around here, this is where my highlights will start to fade and get a, a bit smaller, leaving more of the, the shadow involved. But again, yeah, just paint towards the light would be fine. Even here, like you can actually start to see, like there's less, there's less charge in my brush as well. It just kind of helps with the uh, helps with the uh, the fade that I'm doing here. Then, of course, just to reinforce the front a little bit more, I'll give a second layer just for the first, uh, you know, the first uh, several segments, just to strengthen the highlight a little bit more. <clears throat> like I said, lots of layers. <laughs> Even more this time. And this, uh, this, just this illustration here is actually me going. I didn't make a a brighter color on the palette. Um, this is still the same highlight that I generated before, but now I'm just painting over a second layer on top of it just to reinforce a few extra bright points to to help it out. Now I've switched brushes. So you can now see I'm using. Probably my favorite detail brush um, from Artis Opus, the uh, double zero in the, um, the S series. So now I'm taking really, really bright. This is almost like this highlight is almost pure bright skin. Taking very little amount of paint. <laughs> Even the footage right now, I can see a little bit of like dust at the tip of my brush and <laughs> not great. And um, for this, when we're doing here, we should be thinning our paint now. This is almost, uh, this is like one part water to one part paint. And if you notice, the areas that I'm painting these highlights are actually pretty, like they're much smaller. They're not uh, nearly as large. And again, keeping it light. Um, watching your charge, you're not picking up a lot of paint. If you're picking up too much paint, you know, again, wipe it on your thumb or a kitchen towel and remove it. You a little bit of <laughs> a dust or something. Oh, my brush there. But yeah, I think this is, for me, this is probably uh, the most fun in the highlight stage where you really get to, to punch out these uh, these brightest of uh, highlights and using the small brush to give all these little um, little interesting detail textures onto there. And uh, hopefully you got to see throughout this uh, this process of creating this texture on how 
you know, all the previous layers being kind of messy uh, and where it, it like it leads to. So hopefully it takes some pressure off into, you know, <laughs> being neat. Which uh, the, this uh, <laughs> this lictor was really fun in in that exact context where, you know, I don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be uh, highly demanding in the neatness category of, of painting. You know, especially from like space marines or like armor or mechanical parts, you know. Almost like very scratchy, scribbly type of marks. And the really nice thing is um, what you can do is you can start to take advantage and you start to feel it. One thing when you do this, and you want to notice that the first few marks that you make are probably going to be the strongest marks, so they're going to have the most uh, the most opacity in the paint. And as you're as you continue to paint the next few strokes and keep going, your brush is starting to lose even more charge. So your your brush strokes will get even softer and more like transparency and, and scratchy. So once you kind of get a feel for this doing the first few, be observant of that. And the nice thing is when your brush is like running out of paint or it's getting very, very light, you can kind of use, you can take that, you can take advantage of that by finding areas that need just little touches and, and going around and uh, adding those in as you see fit. Even another thing you can also do to help you test out the the finish and how thin your paint is is just do just do like one mark do a couple of like marks or a couple of lines like little strokes at the like the brightest point of the model and actually let it rest let it dry completely if um something i don't know if you've been noticing when the paint is being applied when i first place it on it looks quite bright but if you take a look at the head, for instance, what you thought was very quite bright actually starts to dull down a little bit. And this is even more so in hand rather than just on the camera. And that's just due to, you know, wet paint is always going to look more, uh, more vibrant, a lot stronger when it's wet, um, simply because of the wet finish, you know, has a little bit of a shine to it. So it's reflecting the light. And this is also amplified with the camera even more so. But as the layer, as that paint layer dries, the paint will dull down. So uh, a good habit to do, um, especially if you're, you know, maybe you're not as familiar with the colors that you're using, or I don't know if you even noticed it, but a good thing to do is like, I would never judge anything by wet paint. Um, I really want to judge the, the final application when it is dry. And then, um, for instance, for me, when I'm painting this, I'm quite familiar with these colors. So um, when I paint it, even though it looks wet, I know with the consistency with uh, with the, the painting the brush, especially doing all these multiple layers, you know, you're learning even more on how it's being applied. Um, I got a better under I got a better idea. And I don't have to necessarily wait for the entire layer to dry completely to uh, to know uh, to expect uh, these results. <laughs> Actually, uh, personally, this is that show this show these uh the shoulder kind of shoulder guards shoulder plates are probably some of my favorite 
um, shapes, my favorite curves on the lictor. As you can see, um, where my highlights are being placed, I'm really following the apex of those curves and going up towards that uh, point, which is, uh, you know, closest to the light that's coming upwards. There's a bit of a recess in the middle, so it's almost like a bit of a break where it goes into a little bit of shadow and then um, following the curve going out uh, right where my brush is there, then it goes back into the light again. Um, as I'm continuing to highlight this and you get to see uh, the brush strokes are happening, if you haven't already, I really appreciate it if you uh, liked and subscribed to my YouTube channel in this video, as well as if you have any uh, questions or comments. Um, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section as well, where I do my very best to get back to each and every one, whether it's just uh, either compliments are fine, but of course, if you have any questions about the painting and the techniques, um, feel free to ask me and I'll do my very best to answer them the best I can for you. Also, if you really enjoy the content on the on my YouTube channel and what I've been posted, if you want to catch more of my painting, I do have a Patreon where my Patreon subscribers uh, gain access to all of my uh, previous tutorials. There's over almost 60 of them and over 100 hours <laughs> worth of content stuff. Everything from uh, multi-part tutorials of my some of my largest projects, especially um, Horace Lupercal or Lionel Johnson, just to name a few, as well as um, to help you guys, to help my students build up even a better, uh, more full portfolio of their painting skills. I also have a foundation section where we break down all the foundational techniques, mainly with like brushwork, um, everything from that, from light placement, volume control, um, things that we can just uh, take into every single one of our paintings with exercises that come along with that to help you sharpen up your skills, especially preparing for that next um, big project. So if you're looking to, um, if you're looking to uh, expand your portfolio, expand your understanding of miniature painting and, uh, you know, really want to push your, your level of skill and creativity, uh, consider joining as well as I do have multiple tiers onto there. So everything from if you're just a, a video learner, um, <laughs> go right ahead with the essentials. Or if you're looking for like a little more of an involved with more feedback, there's also a couple of tiers in there for you, which, uh, you know, come back, come with like monthly feedback to even one-on-one um, -on -one video tutoring as well. But going back through here, you can really see where I'm emphasizing the highlights. Again, it's always going towards the front of the model. And as you can see, the highlights get weaker and weaker as it goes back away from the, the front. And I'm just using more of that highlight color again because you also have to remember with these softer marks that we're making with these highlights, the paint is like watered down at least around like one to one or sometimes like one and a half parts water to one part. The ratio, the exact ratio is not important other than it's making more of a transparent lighter mark. And the reason why I'm going over the, the previous marks is, again, to reinforce them and make them brighter. This just really allows me a little more um, control when doing these highlights. So, um, you know, I can do a single pass and then if it needs more, I can always build up slowly. That way, you know, you're not making a million different or, you know, a million different colored mixes on the palette. I can really just get the, <laughs> you know, essentially uh, several different value layers just from one uh, mix of the palette and uh, you know if your your charge is set correct you're making a light enough mark with uh, a bit of uh, transparency in your paint mixed on the palette from your dilution you get multiple values just with that one here for the final this is where i finally add white into the highlight mix I know it's a little bit hard to see on the the the, uh, the palette uh, camera there, 
um, just due to the lighting situation. But um, here I am just grabbing the brightest of these highlights. These highlights here, if anything, I would be the most reserved into them. So I'm only using this mainly on the head because that's where I really want a lot of the um, the focus to be on is, uh, you know, going around the head and I will hit around the crown area as well. More focusing on the upper parts, the very, the very high exposed areas of the crown. This again helps reinforce that kind of vignette look of it in the uh, in the final outcome where I like to always emphasize the brightest areas around the, uh, the, the character. In this case, it's this bug <laughs> and his head garnishes the most attention. You can see I'm only like picking out those very, very highest points. And even on the shoulders here, I'll probably just hit the tip of the shoulders. So those tops and then the few at the, the bottom. I could have been a little more reserved on there, but I was like, eh, they look too cool. <laughs> But again, like I said, you know, if you going, if you went too bright everywhere, um, we can help correct this in the uh, the next stage when we get to the uh, we get to the AK shades. Here we go. So these new shades from AK, these deep shades, I think they're great. Um, they have like a base set of colors, which are really, really useful, as well as a pot that is like their medium. If you used Games Workshop contrast paints, I think, I think you can understand like it's kind of like their way of, uh, of making an alternate solution. Um, the contrast paints in general from Games Workshop um, the newer ones, especially the full pigment ones, are more for like, you know, base coat coverages. This is more of a, a shading slash unification tool. So I thin a little bit down already with that shading medium, but I'll have some more on handy in the tub later. As you can see, as I'm going to apply this on here, I'm going to apply it fairly thick with more emphasis of this mix into the midtones and to the shadows. So I don't necessarily really want to touch the highlights all that much. And what I'm doing here now is there's a bit of that. Um, there's just that the medium straight medium out of the pot in my brush. As you can see, as I'm actually painting on top of it with that medium. So it almost like thins it out. Well, it does thin it out. It doesn't almost it does thin it out. And that's to help protect your highlights because I still want those brighter points to, you know, punch out and be effective. I don't want to dull down the entire thing, but um, it's nice. And you also have a bit of a working time, even though this is an acrylic product. So you don't need like, you know, you, this is not being thinned with mineral spirits. This is all like water based acrylics, but there seems to be some sort of retarder in there. So uh, it gives you an extended working time. And the nice thing is it does dry quite matte. So that's also really, really handy. Again, you got to see me um, just wiping off. It's almost like you're removing a little bit of the paint. Um, so I just have a, a little bit of that thinner on my brush and I'm just pulling, I'm just, you know, uh, pulling that, uh, pulling the excess away and uh, more emphasis on pulling it away from the, the top of the highlights. That's quite sweet. I really like the, like, I really like the general look of this and when it dries, it's also really nice. It dries really matte. So it doesn't dry with like uh, a, a lot of shine to it which is um, my preferred 
uh, my preference on most of my projects. Again, most of that wash or most of the shade will be more on the, the left side. Another interesting thing is when you're doing like this, this shade and you don't even, I'm not going to say you have to use this stuff. Um, but if you were to just, but the uh, general principle is when you're doing these shades, the nice thing is that when you at, when you're doing the, like doing a wash or a unification like this, the cool thing is, is that it acts as a screen. So all those really, really, really rough marks under there actually get a little bit softer. So keep aware of that as well. But this also can work to your advantage. So if you felt like you've made really, really harsh marks, maybe you didn't thin the paint enough or, you know, if it's your first time doing this kind of scratchy type of, you know, um, uh, th this type of like brushwork, um, this stage right here actually helps um, you know, give a bit of a, a softer area and it also just naturally starts to blend everything a little bit. Sorry to get back to the, the painting. I'm taking a second AK shade and this is like their their dark shade. So it's like a, an off black. It's not like super strong black. So that's nice because if it was just pure black, that would be really, really harsh. I like this because it actually has um, you know, a cutoff to it, so it's not so stark. And uh, after the red shade that I did, or that that human, it was like that human flesh that I used. Um, now I'm just adding a little bit of this uh, this dark this uh, dark shade into there. And again, concentrating even more in the shadows. You can see I've done more of the <laughs> the model too. So with the bone done, now we're gonna focus our attention back uh, back to this uh, purple skin. So just to remind you, we're using this sunset purple mixed just in with a little bit of black. And then um, I added a little bit of deep red from AK into there just to bring a little more, uh, you know, <laughs> a little more red into the picture, warm it up a little bit more. Giving that down a little bit of water, thinning it out. Again, you know, 25, 35% water. And then uh, grabbing a little bit of white to the right here just to make a, a secondary uh, highlight and see. Also testing out to see how those, like how the white <laughs> also like reacts and what I need to do. Maybe I'd add some fuchsia in there or something like that, but. I think it's okay to work with right now. So one of the things that's going to be a little bit different from the this, I, I'm just going to call it the skin, is um, I want to be a little more, a uh, little bit more smoother with this one, where the bone I really want to be like really, really, uh, like really, really harsh, rough lines. Um, the skin will be a little bit smoother. Now I'm going to start with the head. And what you're going to notice is that, again, we're going to be using the brush direction and really emphasize a few points onto the head. So the first main highlight that I'll be, that I place there is on the roundest part of the, uh, of the, uh, the top of the head. Again, what I was saying about looking at curves is I'm looking at apex of the curve and at the apex of the head, um, that's where the majority of the, the light gathers. And to help with the blend, um, to help with the transition, all of my paint strokes, I, the majority of them, I'm going to do my best to end at the, at the apex. And this just helps again with, um, how pigment and paint uh, comes off your brush. As you can see, like when we're painting, 
at the end of our stroke, that's where a little bit of extra paint gets deposited at the end. And as we, you know, we're like pulling it across the model, if you can know if you can just imagine it, the paint is being dispensed through your brush and we're pulling this like puddle across the surface and where we end up is where all that little bit of like that kind of like that drag that ends at the end of your stroke. So we can use that because at the end of the stroke, that's where the most amount of power is in pigment. So by always painting up in the direction towards the light as much as you can, will naturally give us this faded, like, I don't know, you can almost like, call, almost call it like a comet's tail. You know how it gets very, very faint at the very tip and then just gets brighter and brighter as it gets towards, um, uh, towards the focal point or the head of the comet. Here on the arm, that's a really good example of that. See, I'm gonna gather a lot of light at the wrist, and then I'm gonna gather all the light or all most of the highlight at that point where my brush is right there, kind of on the, um, the, the curvature of the arm, the, the forearm musculature of the of the, the lictor's arm. Again, that you, even though it's a gentler curve, there's still an apex to that curve and I will gather most of the light at the apex. Here I just chose another, I chose like a secondary point or kind of like on the elbow. And to also help you see this uh, this brush stroke in action, I really, um, I really emphasize that you try a single stroke ending at the apex where you want the light to go. And I'll actually just, it sounds boring, but watching paint dry, you like see the mark that it's making and you'll get a stronger idea how um, you'll see the, uh, the strength of the stroke be a little bit lighter at the start and be a little bit more a little bit stronger at the finish of where your stroke ended but um you know working on this arm as a demonstration for the video the most the emphasis or the larger of the highlights not just in the brightness, but also the size of the highlights will be larger in the forward facing part compared to the, um, you know, the, the other highlight points that are, you know, not as forward facing. see I really you know like the highlights are just getting just that much smaller and it's really like I'm really gathering it around that uh, that point on the head again it's where like the apex of that curve dead center where I find it the most interest into there and that's the thing like when if you ever get hung up on where to place highlights the, the last thing, I guess the, the final rule is, I would say, is to also serve your interest. Like what is the most interesting part of the model or the, the most interesting part of that segment? If you just bring more highlight into that area, that's the focal point. And that's where you you see the most, uh, you see the most interest into there. So bringing that area to the most of the light and just, you know, you can be selective too, right? You know, well, I'm asking you to be selective, <laughs> you know, um, instead of like, I just love the whole head, but then you can also ask yourself, what parts of the head do I really like? Because if I, you know, I love these Cthulhu-like tentacles, I think they're really, really cool. It's 
part of the reason why I've always enjoyed the Lictor and why I also chose it. Um, mainly because from like second edition Warhammer, I remember I had a friend uh, who collected Tyranids and he had a, a few Lictors in his army and they were terrifying to face, but they looked also looked really cool. And to me, they also, um, you know, gave me a, they, they sparked my imagination a lot when you play them because like, you know, they're hiding in the shadows. They're like camouflage, kind of like the predator. Um, you know, they have like really cool parts of the alien. And then they also have like this, you know, weird Cthulhu like thing of the, in front of the tentacles. And, you know, they all kind of like, came together and I really liked it. So, um, you know, that's why I also chose it. But on the face here, you know, I, I like the tentacles, but I don't need to paint the entire part. I really want to give emphasis to his eyes and to the his kind of like his bulbous part of his head. So even painting the 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 facial tentacles if you notice that all my highlights, the majority of the highlights are grouped up towards its eyes. They're bigger in size and they're higher in value. As it goes, travels down the tentacles, it actually gets lower. So it's not like I don't like them. Um, they're still part of the model, but again, I'm painting up towards the light. I'm painting up towards the focal point that I find more, like just a little bit more interesting. So, um, you know, it, 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 it will help you out when you when you're, you know, painting the miniature. And if you're ever stuck again, like I said, if you're ever stuck on where to place highlights it, at the very end is you can just guide people to what you find the most interesting and the features you find uh, the most appealing. Um, in general, for me, you know, of course, also working that I want to try to create a little more of a realistic lighting atmosphere. Um, but, you know, having things always in mind, but they're not hard concrete rules, but, you know, you want to respect them. But at the same time, um, you know, we can always make, <laughs> uh, we can always make artistic choices that suit our creative needs, you know, like, uh, yeah, probably, you, that you've heard it you know like rules are meant to be broken but you should always know about them first and know and then have a better idea of like when do i want to break them and hit or when do i want to obey them here i found like the 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 middle part of the forearm was um you know, a little bit too dark. There's a little too much uh, contrast in between each layer. So as a correction, I actually mixed a bridge and uh, uh, a value of purple that is in between the, the current highlight that I was painting at the beginning and, uh, and between the shadow color. So I call that a bridge just because it's in between the two values. And then I started to paint more in between them and use that as uh, the the remainder of the highlight just as a reactionary thing because the the first values that I was painting on the hand right at the beginning I thought was a little too bright and uh, I want to layer a little bit slower so that's just uh, me uh, reacting to uh, a mixture of the paint that I think I got a little bit wrong And here's an illustrated difference between the front of the arm and the rear of the arm. So the, the part of the arm that I'm painting is, is facing away from the front. So I don't want to just leave that <laughs> non-painted. We need to paint a little bit of a highlight. But just to give you an idea that it's not just about the value, but it's also about the size of the highlight. As you can see, the front of the arm, the highlights are much larger, um, giving us the impression that the light is from the front.
don't know if you can see the different styles in stroke that we can change from the initial scratchiness of the bone and then being a you know a longer and smoother strokes uh, onto the purple skin So now I'm getting to the the higher final highlights of the purple. Switch to my double zero. The, uh, the paint consistency here is about, you know, one to one and a half parts water to one part paint. So, you know, I want a lighter touch. And again, you can see how much smaller these highlights are being uh, quite reserved in the size. We don't want to cover up the previous um, layers and um, you know really focusing that light at the apex or the part that i found the most interesting i like those parts just because there is um, you know there's some interesting details there you know there's the i don't know why there's some sort of ventilation holes or something in his brain i don't know he, he <laughs> too much brain processing and he needs to uh, i don't know vent it out who knows but I thought that curvature is very interesting. And um, again, I, I said like, especially for like placing highlights and stuff, curves are always like, in general, they almost always your friend. Uh, flat, <laughs> flat areas are um, m much more difficult to make uh, more, uh, more highlights and more dramatic. That just goes with like, you know, people uh, like dynamic shapes. That's why people are most people prefer like mountain ranges rather than flat, flat prairies. <laughs> um, that just comes from, you know, my comparison being in BC compared to, you know, um, being in like uh, prairie lands and like Alberta and stuff. Not to say there's no beauty in, in very flat landscape. It's just, well, once you've seen one, it's kind of, you've seen it all. <laughs> but uh, with curvatures, you know, there's all these various angles and it just gives us painters more opportunity to, um, you know, pick out those little peaks and valleys and, and, and of interest. So that always goes into the consider that also, that also just goes into consideration of the models that I really like to paint. As you can see, I'm really pushing the, the light at the front of the face there. Because, uh, you know, very kind of a little bit similar to the idea that I, you know, I have with the mantis claws, you know, the front of the mantis claws um, that's closest to the viewer, give a little more emphasis, bring them forward. And on the face, you know, uh, there is that secondary reflection on the bulbous of the head, but the front of the face gets a little bit more little bit of a just a small little bit of visual hierarchy within um, the uh, the most important element to me which is the head and of course like that the hands uh, to me are also uh, for characters are a high um, secondary element that you should get important um, hands are always in uh, you know mostly are giving emphasis on models just because they're the things that we use to manipulate the world or the creature uses to manipulate the world you know he gets the lictor he you know he does everything from like crawling holding on to things to holding his victims or slashing at his victims picking up things anything you know they're, they're tactile they're, they're they're the ones that he interacts the world with the most Maybe besides his like mouth <laughs> or, and his mantis claws are also up there. But besides that, actually, like a fun little thing that I really like about particularly like the, the Lictor's hands is it really reminds me or actually a lot of the model, of course, a lot of uh, Geiger influence of, of Alien. And um, that being possibly my all time favorite Alien science fiction creature of all time. 
and uh, it's so so notorious you know you can't help but see its influence on uh, so many other aliens or I think it's one of the first alien uh, illustrations of a creature that really truly looks alien so if you need uh if you want any references also to see where like light falls on the alien in this kind of like exo kind of skeleton skin limbs um you know, just open up Pinterest or Google Images or something and, and, and Google the, the alien and I bet you, you know, you should be able to find a million different uh, paintings, drawings, not only from him, but from other artists who have, who've painted or drawn that silhouette and you can see where they've placed light emphasis and uh, get an idea, um, ideas for your own where you want to place them or how various curvatures and illustrations are done. Or, you know, you can also use this tutorial. If you like the choices I made. Here I just do a slight correction on the head. See I'm grabbing that uh, that mid-tone that we used prior and I start just to paint a little bit more of the mid-tone. Um, you know, creating the transition a little bit longer. I felt it was just going from the deep purple into the very very light uh, highlights a little too quickly and it was actually missing a, a bit of the mid-tone color into it. So um, you know, when doing this, this is probably like two parts water to one part paint. And when the paint is much thinner this way, I'm actually also using it to paint in the area and paint over the highlight. Since the, uh, the paint is fairly transparent now with the thinness of the on on from the palette, it actually stains the highlight. So it will, you know, dull down the highlights. But if you can start to see the result, this is now I'm getting more of that um, that mid-tone, that kind of like uh, pinkish purplish color back into the work where before it was uh, almost going into like a, a black and white. Well, not pure black and white, but like a very desaturated, almost losing a lot of color. So putting that in kind of helped bring back some of the color into the work. And uh, now I'm just going with the brightest highlights. But there's a bit of a, a surprise or a little bit of a change up. Um, there's a couple of uh, <laughs> chapters into here, which is an alternate bonus. You do not have to follow them, but um, I do make some changes to the skin. OK, so purple shading, this is exact same concept as I did uh, with the bone armor this time using a AK's deep purple shade. Now, I, when I tried this one on the purple skin, it didn't come out as much as I planned. I thought this would, I thought the shade would actually be a, a, a richer purple, but it wasn't. But I'm not going to say it was a bad thing because just like how I said how when we are applying this wash, it does a little bit of unification and it being a wash over the entire model, it acts as a screen and softens everything up. So this is actually going to change less about the color, but rather it's going to make all of our uh, sketching work. Uh, yes, you want to call it that it's going to make it softer. So really cool because, you know, I didn't have to. It, this wasn't requiring me to go deep into any sort of like just pure blending stages at all. This kind of just does it for us. 
it will of course like i said before it will dull down the highlights a little bit reduce some things so you can again take the um you can again take the shade medium uh, have your brush with a little bit of that at the end of it and if you did apply the shade over the bright highlights and you want to um, have them to show a little bit more you can use that to bring it there and then after the shade is dry i use a hair dryer to speed it up but i'm not going to show the hair drying process on the video um, you can always go back and touch up your highlights if you found that they got dulled down I forgot if I said that for the bone, but you get the idea if that, you know, you did the shading process and you knock down the highlight a little too much after it dried, just go back and just do little touch ups to bring them back if you want to. bonus time so I found that the purple here was just a little too purple and there wasn't enough variation into there so I want to add a little bit more red just to um, kind of like mer bring the uh, the color a little bit closer to the bone actually um, I found that they're a little too separated for my liking and I wanted to bring the, the work a little bit warmer too. So by making an airbrush glaze, so I've taken uh, Vallejo's uh, Worn Red. It's actually from the Nocturna series paint. You don't need this exact paint. It's kind of, you know, just think of it as like you're getting like a worn, like a desaturated red. Like a, yeah and you're going to make an airbrush glaze so the so there's like six parts thinner to one part paint in here and i'm going to run this through my harder steinbeck um, set at around 18 psi and i'm going to lightly um, in small shots um, airbrush uh, paint over pretty much the entire model more much more focused on the purple skin if this gets on a little bit of the bone, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really hurt me at all. Um, so I'm just doing my best to like kind of aim in the, the purple general direction and go slowly because since we're using an airbrush glaze, you might not see the effect right away. Keep your eyes peeled. You can start to see I hit the head. You can start to see that the uh, now my brightest, mainly from the brightest highlights, get tinted the most just because since they're of a higher value they're the most susceptible to change where in the darker recesses in the shadows um, it's not visually apparent but if you really can't tell maybe you thin this out even more one of another indicators of when you're doing an airbrush glaze is just look for wet areas that's it and um, once you see a wet area let it dry and let it sit. Don't keep blasting on the wet spots. Um, you'll probably saturate the area too much. You might actually blow off the layer or it'll blow off in an uneven fashion. And then once it dries, you can kind of see it. Uh, not the friendly way to see it. <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, I, I really like the look of this. It brings it a warm, brings the entire um, piece warmer to what I've, a temperature a color temperature that I like and um, it's also a really great tool for when you're painting and creating your own schemes as well um, you know it's just a way to modify if you didn't completely get it right and then you want to kind of move the color around this is a an airbrush glaze is a great tool for doing that again it's just like regular um, uh, thinner so in this case I just I believe I had some scale 75 acrylic thinner either that or Tamiya's x20a 
that the thinner is not super important. Generally, you want to use the same thinner as the brand that you're using. I find that just a little bit safer because they're safe to react onto there. And uh, to make the airbrush glaze again, at least six parts thinner to one part paint or more. It's almost going to be like dirty, <laughs> dirty or like, you know, it's like dirty paint water. As you can see, I'm doing this in several layers. So, you know, do one layer at a time, let it dry and then make your judgment call there and then move up. So I believe I went through the entire part doing around three thin passes on all pretty much all of the areas. But the number is not so important as uh, the um, sorry, the number is not so much more important than it is to the visual look of it. So um, be attentive, keep your eyes open, go through there. And then what I'm going to be doing now is rebuilding those highlights with now using that warm red, warm, <laughs> worn red with some white mixture to it thinning it down to um, at least a one to one mixture and reapplying the highlights again. Like I said, it's a bonus. You know, if you liked that purple, just stick with it. But going in the future, if I were to paint this again, I would not just take uh, the sunset purple and start adding, uh, you know, making that off sunset purple mixed with a little bit of uh, mixed with some of that deep red and black and then adding white to highlight. I would then I would rather take that sunset purple and add a lot more of this worn red to it and build up the highlights. Then then you can do the uh, the two washes. That way we can skip the airbrush glazing stage. Um, that's a little, <laughs> I think that should give you a result closer to this. I'm not going to say it's a hundred percent, um, but that is a very close theory to what we're doing. But, um, I kept that process in here and to show you that just so you get the idea and for you also to learn that when you're creating, especially when you're creating like paint themes, you know, don't be afraid to make little tints and changes but i hope you can hear from that explanation that you know if you're going to do an entire army like this or whatever you know you don't have to do the highlights purple do the wash and then tint it later and then reapply the highlights again you know that's extra steps so we could cut off a bit of that just by like highlighting with more of that warm red at the beginning with white then we'll we can pretty much reach the same. I hope that makes sense. I think it does. <laughs> okay, let's give some final attention to the eyes. So the first thing off is um, I didn't have to actually black this in, but I just wanted to get a stronger definition around the eye, clean it up. And then right after the black, when that's dry, I am then going to paint white on the pupil or on top of the eyeball. Mm. If you want the most dramatic, uh, the dramatic part of the eye, do your best not to leave a little bit of the black outline. We're going to be using some fluorescent uh, magenta uh, from AK. Uh, to all my old friends, they know that I love magenta. <laughs> it's kind of like my secret hot sauce. I just love the color and uh, heck, I'm going to use an excuse to put it onto here. You know, it's like a creature of comfort. <laughs> um, the reason why we put the white on is magenta or actually all fluorescent paints are just, you know, weak as weak as F. Um, they have very poor coverage. Now we, we, you can actually use this to our advantage. So one, when the fluorescent paint goes on top of the white, it's going to grab the most. It's going to be like, boom, you're going to see it. But we can also start to paint this fluorescent paint and I'm going to paint around the surrounding part of the eyes. You can think of this as like glowing eyes. Um, but, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the nice thing is it's actually, if anything, for me, how this ended up is it actually just brings a color variation into the, the face and it brings a lot of attention to the eyes and to the forefront. So, um, you know, 
it, it kind of is like kind of a glow, but it doesn't completely <laughs> respect the entire line of sight of the glowing eyes, but regardless. But to reinforce the eye and to reinforce the paint, so if you saw me, I am applying multiple stages of white. So I can put a white and then you layer on top of the, the fluorescent paint. And then after that's dry, you can apply the white again. But do your best to make the, the, the white application even smaller. And then after the white's applied, what do you think you're gonna do? More magenta. This will just help strengthen out the area and give you a bit of like a faux easy blend on these on this small area for the uh, for the magenta. And the final highlights here. I know the camera kind of looks blown out. This looks like white, but it's not. I mixed white with the fluorescent paint. Sorry about that. The, it was a bit it was a bit tricky to film um, to get the exposure right, but that is white and fluorescent magenta mixed for the final spot. All right, claws. I almost forgot about the claws. You actually see the progress um, be in reverse. So you actually, I paint the claws earlier, but anyway, the claws are very simple. All I have is two colors on the palette. There is black and then there is pastel yellow. And when you mix uh, the pastel yellow into the black, we're gonna start to get a little bit of gray. But the nice thing is, is gray is gonna contain yellow in it. So going through that warm theme, you know, trying to keep all the colors uh, uh, of the uh, of the lictor in a in a warmer, uh, some warmer uh, hues. We're going to base coat all of this, this dark gray, which is really mixed with pastel yellow. And you're going to just give a base coat on all of them, even on these uh, little nails, I don't know, teeth things. <laughs> But yeah, real simple stuff. Just give a base coat onto them. Um, I hardly diluted the paint, so it really covers off in one. And uh, again, the palette, I'm gonna mix a little more pastel yellow in here to get the first uh, highlights. And this is gonna be a fairly simple layering exercise. When, we're, when you're uh, highlighting these nails, what I like to tend to do is since the light is coming from a more upwards direction again we want to paint towards the light so in these uh in these claws here or these little like teeth on to here um you're gonna notice that i do more layers than i initially need to um honestly um the amount of layers that i do is i look back at the video it's kind of redundant you could really could have uh crushed this in like two to three, especially on the small ones. But as I was doing all the claws together, um, and some of them come in various lengths, um, that's why I go over, especially the ones on the, the matches claws with more layers than it really needs to. But especially for these, like these nails, they're longer. But if you noticed, the emphasis of the light is actually upwards. So it's not towards the tip, it's upwards because the light is coming from above. It's just like those little details that will like help you give more um, direction to your light source, especially, you know, painting in this style. Just these little clues of everything is always like falling towards the light. It's also the same for these little um, these teeth here. I didn't wasn't super honestly, uh, you know, I think you could do a better job <laughs> of doing these little small ones probably on yours. But the idea, again, what I really wanted to a little more emphasize is that the ones that are more forward should be getting uh, a little bit brighter. Surprise, more pastel yellow. <laughs> See here so like the, the largest part of the highlight is at the top of that nail and then i just paint down like one of the the ridges uh, again curvatures apexes yeah 
and the, the bigger highlight got on that forefinger and then the the two secondary fingers which is like kind of like that middle then the pinky which are further away from us get smaller highlights See, yeah, not even like the back two really get much of a light at all, I don't think. Hmm, yeah, two little thoughts, but nothing much. Now the base to bring it all together. Surprise, green. <laughs> I love green. And um, I think for this miniature, especially, it's going to help even more. Um, you know, we have like, we'll be I mean, using the base and using these colors as a nice contrast. So there's a lot of warm elements from above and we're going to put, uh, some, uh, cooler colors down below. Um, and we're going to be doing some kind of like a pseudo wet blend. So a lot of the paint here, I'm just applying, uh, the, it's called, uh, Misfits Green. And this is going to go on fairly thick. Again, all the paints are going to be in the YouTube description with the manufacturers, of course. And while that's still wet, we're going to be um, throwing down some burnt umber. Now, I'm just doing all wet on wet. I'm just mashing, I'm going to be mashing a bunch of like wet colors into here. Now, like judging from the final part, I think you've seen in the, the photos that most of the base is covered in tufts. So you know, not super critical that because you don't see most of this. But when I was developing this base, I wasn't totally sure if I was going to use that many tufts. I thought I was going to put a bit or I didn't, you know, didn't have an idea. But when I'm painting this and mashing these uh, colors into the base, all I want to do is get a various amounts of tones into the base that are kind of closer together. And just since I'm painting with the paint really wet, I just want them to kind of mash together. And this just goes from the fact of like when you look at uh, the ground or you look at dirt and rocks and you know it's easy to think to say that grass is green well you know it actually has a lot of different greens in there it's got some greens it's got some yellows it's got oranges some of the grass is burnt even like the soil you know there could be some you know there's variations within uh like little subtle uh hue changes and stuff in there so the whole point and what I like to do with bases is a lot of times I like to mash colors like this into the base just to give me a a more of a natural randomly feeling base tone to work from and then I could do other things from there I could do like you know we could do a little bit of dry brushing of a single color to kind of unify the highlights all together or we can use washes. And I actually do both of those as we get through here. But this is uh, the, working like this just helps the base feel a little more random, a little more natural rather than such a strong aside uh, it's just a flat tone. But also if you use like a single flat tone, it almost is like overpowering because you really only have one color at the bottom of everything. And, you know, we have you know, a lot of like a few different color variations into the model. You know, there's various forms of brown and orange, and then there's uh, purples and reds in the, the skin as well with some magenta. Um, the, the ground needs a little bit of hiding. So this is what it looks like when it's pretty much dry. Again, I use a hairdryer to help speed that up. And now what I'm doing here is I am taking uh, misfits green mixed with some pastel yellow and I have a, a small dry brush from artist opus and I am kind of stippling it on I'm not doing like too much of like a back and forth kind of uh, dry brush motion as you maybe would commonly see I'm kind of like stabbing it which gives me more of a dry brush stippling effect 
it'll still hit more of the high high parts areas but i really don't want to get i really don't want to see too much of those you know sometimes you get drag marks from from dry brushing and uh don't want any of that so kind of stab it onto here and i smash and uh that's what it's going to look like before we get to a wash so AK was really kind, of course, to send me some of uh, these washes along with those um, along with those shades. These are enamels, so you will need a sort of thinner. They supply me with their own form of thinner, which um, smells like a cheap cologne. <laughs> um, I don't recommend huffing it, but it, it honestly, actually, funny enough, it actually is like at least more pleasantly bearable to use rather than their uh, regular enamel thinners, which is kind of nice. The mixture I have there, I showed the bottles of blue and green, is because I mixed those two together to give me a, a more of a cooler green. I really wanted a, a colder uh, contrasting temperature. And uh, I made a bit of a mixture and I put it in a, uh, a, a, spare, a spare paint bottle so I can use for later. In that little petri dish there is the thinner. So now I'm just getting some thinner, rinsing my brush in the thinner, but also applying the thinner back down onto the base just to weaken some areas. So again, I'm not looking for like a solid, like even an even application of this wash throughout the entire model or in the entire base. As well, I, so now I can do what I like to do is to even apply some of this um, almost as like a, a wash slash color filter now onto the base of the uh, of the lictor so getting it onto his feet and his lower legs this also helps with the lighting effect that we've been generating with uh, our light placement and uh, enhancing that vignette effect by um, you know giving some of the, uh, the base tones and the lower base tones into its legs and merging those, uh, blending the, the lower parts of the leg into the base to, to give that, enhance that vignette effect. It's also why, <laughs> if you ever have this in plan to do, don't spend a lot of time, you know, working on your like highlights or your, your textured blends and stuff at the feet. Uh, you know, I didn't take much time at all to highlight the, 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 the claws on the and the hooves of the model because I knew this was going to happen. That would be a waste of time. But doing enough just so you can see it. The nice thing is also with these enamel washes rather than making it oil washes, enamel washes will dry faster, which is nice. It's got a quicker working time. But it's still like long <laughs> in comparison to acrylics. So you should really, you know, let that dry. I use a hair dryer to assist a little bit, but I let that sit for, um, you know, several hours to, for it to dry and to work. Now to glue on some tufts. I had a bunch of like tufts from Gamer Grass and, and Vallejo. So I always have like a few out. And then um, I put one on, put that small one there, didn't glue it down, but now I will just to give it a test and just to make sure they kind of fit. They work out quite nicely with the base as it's a warmer, lighter green at the top with a foundation that we painted up with the cooler and darker green. And of course you can see now the final results we have in the various photos. If you enjoyed the tutorial, which I hope you did, uh, don't forget to give a uh, like and subscribe. And of course, uh, once again, if you'd like to continue to support uh, my channel and gain access to, you know, 100 more hours of tutorials and more in-depth coverage of other miniatures, such as like Horus or the Lion, consider subscribing to my Patreon, where I update it uh, with a new video between three and five tutorials a month. So it works out to be like, you know, almost once a week and uh, also gain access to my patreon only discord where you can share your progress ask questions get feedback and further progress your learning 
Thanks very much for watching the video and we'll see you in the next one. Happy painting.